four things I'm going to be talking about today. A little bit about the carbon budget first, following on from Mike's comments there, uh, about thermal imaging, which is sort of proof of concept in some ways of some of the ideas I'm talking about, and then focusing on soil, plant, uh, animal, ruminant magic. And if there's time, the value proposition for 100% transition to regenerative agriculture. Um, so this is a farm, this is a carbon budget for Lake Hawea. They were the first people to have a certified carbon budget. Uh, what's interesting about this budget is that if you look on the debit side, you've got the methane emissions, okay? And you've got the CO2. On the, on the credit side, you've got tree planting and regenerating bush, and, you've, and that's it. They've taken off 1,000 um, tonne of carbon for, uh, just for a buffer. But if you look at the accounting here, there's no allowance for a methane sink. Okay? I'll, I'll explain that later. And there's no allowance for soil carbon. And the third thing, which is probably even a little more tricky, is uh, there's, no, there's no allowance for a direct cooling of the local environment. So what we have here is, you know, really, I mean, that's really dodgy accounting, okay? So here, here's just a couple of examples. You can see that in that pie graph there, soil, uh, the, the soil carbon uh, reservoir is bigger than the air and, uh, and biomass by far. So the, the world's soils hold a huge amount of carbon. And that... that um, you know, I'm not really a scientist. I, I, I've taught soil science at sort of level one. So, you know, I can only go so far. But what, that, that first uh, formula there is what happens to, to methane in the air. Basically, it gets oxidised. Okay? And that oxidised... This is, this, is, this is sort of well known. That oxidise... That, that's just the first step in that oxidisation process. And eventually it just gets turned back into CO2. So where does hydroxyl come from? That, that they, they call that the, the, the d detergent of the air. It comes from water vapour and the presence of ultraviolet light. So you have much water vapour on your properties? Yeah, fair bit, eh? And you got, we've, we know in this country we've got heaps of ultraviolet light. So there, there, there are two of those things that are just not in, not in, the, not in the accounting. The third one, direct temperature reduction. Um, I did some, I did some um, thermal imaging a couple of summers ago, and um, you know, I just got a little, a little uh, lens on the end of my cell phone. And this is a, this is a park just down the road from my place. I'm, I'm from Whangarei. And if you look there, you can see um, you've got the, you've got the turf on one side. You've got the, the bush on the other side, and down the middle is a herbicide strip. If, I don't know if you can read those numbers, but the bush and the turf are as cool as 29 degrees. This was a, you know, it's like a summer day. And the, the herbicide strip is as hot as 53 degrees. So that's like a, what is it, 24 degree difference. Okay? Now we're talking that by 2070, we might have a 2.5 degree increase in temperature. Well, just down the road, there's a, there's a, there's a 20 plus degree increase. And let's look, we'll look at the significance of that. This is amazing, eh? This is, this is um, probably the most important process on the planet's photosynthesis. And that is primary production around the world. And the blue is where you've got a heap of primary production and photosynthesis. You can see it changes between the, between the um, seasons, uh, between the hemispheres. And look at New Zealand just pumping away down there. Eh? Especially Northland, eh? It's, uh, <laughs> so that, 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 that is, as I said, that's probably the most important process we have. And, and in my mind, it's probably the... It's the it's the silver bullet for climate change. So, yeah, back to that. There's no allowance for it. Okay? So, Max... Uh, sorry, uh, Walter Yenner, he said, if the government send you a bill for the, car for the methane you produce, send them another bill 100 times more for the amount of hydroxyl you're producing on your land. 
Now, I'm saying here that emissions reduction is part of the story. I mean, I've got an EV, okay? I've got an electric bike, electric mower. I, the only thing I don't have that's electric is a chainsaw. But, um, but what I'm saying is that emissions reductions are important, but it's not the only thing. So I'm going against the, the grain here a little bit, okay? Against the scientific consensus. But we've been there before, eh? We've gone against the scientific consensus. Do you remember, like I remember when I was a young adult, we, were start, we started to be told, don't eat butter, it'll kill you, you know? And um, eat margarine. There's some sort of industrial substance that we put on our bread. I mean, who's done that? Who's, who's been, can you put your hands up if you've been stupid enough to eat margarine? Yeah, yeah, okay, and cut all the fat off your meat and all that sort of stuff and buy the meat, buy the milk with, that tastes like water, you know? That's what we've been meant to do. So that was wrong. There's been a lot of, a um, lot of, lot of literature, scientific literature coming out lately to say that, you know, like fat isn't the problem. It was, it's a very... See, so what happens, we, we make policy a bit like we make concrete. So we take science, which is sort of quite fluid, and it should be fluid. We should be learning all the time and advancing in our knowledge. And the policy makers sort of read the room and, and, and respond to the different things happening. And that, 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 that mix of policy and science becomes like concrete. And it becomes immovable. And here we have this thing from the IPCC down focusing us on, on, um, on carbon emissions. And that is like taking a plastic knife to a gunfight. Okay? How's that working for us? Not very well, eh? So what I'm, what I'm saying here, basically, is that um, farming isn't a problem, it's a solution. Okay? But it's a solution if it's done properly. And I speak as a non-farmer and the father of a vegan. Um, so here's th thermal imaging again. This is, these are Kumara. Kumara rose up in, up in uh, Dargaville, where I'm, where I'm from. Um, I say with great pride. Um, now, you can see that where the, the young Kumara are growing, the blue there is about 30 degrees. Okay, because the ground is actually hotter than the, than the air. Okay, that's why these temperatures are so high. But 45 degrees in the, in the, in the hollows, you know, where, where, the bears, where the soil is still bare. So, you know, a, um, horticulture actually has a problem. I mean, annual, annual cropping is, is problematic because of this factor. There's a, there's a farm gate. The pasture behind the, behind the fence, very cool, relatively speaking. That uh, limestone race is up to 52 degrees, okay? Um, I don't know if you know this, but, like, I, I don't think I've got the slide in here, but uh, one of the slides was... was of, uh, was in the dunes at the beach. And uh, the spin effects, you know, have you had that experience where when you run across the dunes, you go from sort of plant to plant? So, and when, when, you, when you hit the bare sand, that is 70 degrees, okay? It's a bit like if you're on a deck, a, d a deck that's probably dark colour, that's the same sort of temperature. You know what 70 degrees is now. That's what that feels like too hot to walk on. So what we have is we have, you would have seen, you would have seen subdivisions like this, hey? Um, and these subdivisions, um, you know, the, typically they have black roofs now. And it's, this is where the city dwellers that throw rocks at farmers live, in these, in these, um, in these very, very hot places. The hot asphalt road, the black, the black roof. So that, you know, they're typically two degrees hotter than... Far, you know, cities are typically two degrees hotter than, than um, the countryside. So just getting on to soil, um, the soil plant ruminant magic. I'm, I'm assuming you, you, you people know this, but, you know, the soils in North America, for example, and the grasslands there, they were built up by these massive herds of, of, of ruminants. And they, they, they developed soils that were metres deep in places. 
then you know, very clever humans came along and, and rubbish, uh, uh, trashed that soil you know, just in a, in a few decades. And, and you ended up with, um, you know, with the dust bowl phenomena. So th that's, a, um, that's, where, that's what we need to be aware of. There's a magic when, when you get animals on the land. And that animal plant soil dynamic is so important. But that's if you do it properly. So, um, yeah, I know Judith Schwartz. Interesting, she's written a few books. For, for example, Cows Save the Planet. And um, she says this. I think I need my glasses. When we hear about climate, the story we get is that it's all about greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels. But in its most basic sense, the story of climate is the story of what happens when sunlight hits the ground, whether the solar energy is incorporated into life forms or becomes sensible heat. What determines the fate of sunlight is natural cycles, the carbon, water, nutrient, energy cycles, which are driven by the activity of plants, animals, and microbes. In other words, life. So, you know, we, uh, meet, we probably do need to have a few, maybe some fewer animals, maybe stocking rates need to be de-intensified de in some places. But we don't want to be abandoning pasture-raised uh, farm production in favour of that, the, the, the image there on the left-hand side. Because you can imagine, if, you, if, I, put, if I took my uh, thermal camera to those areas, the one on the left would be probably 20, 30 degrees hotter easily. So, I mean, I've, in, my, in my later years in, at North Tech, I was doing research into regenerative food systems, and I, I, I visited quite a, quite a few farms. I've been very interested in those farms that are taking on um, regenerative practices. And it just seems, from what I've observed, is the diverse pastures seem to be the underpin the whole system. They seem to be the like the magic source, com combined with those long long rotations and reduced inputs. And you've got to be, you know, think of me for a moment. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what you guys know. So <laughs> this is uh, this is just my my view from from as an observer, really. There was an interesting guy here who talked about, um, that was Graham Sait, and he was talking about how this, how this transfers to, um, for, to dollars. And uh, this is an Australian study. They were looking at the impact of, they were looking at why a lot of farms were just failing in, to, in, in relation to others, and the biggest factor was, was the amount of carbon in the soil that differentiated a farm that was, was surviving to a farm that wasn't. So from my observations, I don't know if you can read that, but uh, they, 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 pasture diversity and long rotations increases nutrient and micronutrient availability. And the micronutrients are really important, improves animal health. And I was talking to a guy the other day, he was saying that in, in the work he's been doing, this is it's calm the farm, they've found that like a 20 to, uh, sorry, a 40 to 80% reduction in animal health costs. And that's pretty consistent with the people I've been talking to. Um, we're going to put a lot of vets out of work. Um, a more diverse rhizosphere, so there's a whole lot more happening in the soil. More organic matter and carbon sequestration and greater biodiversity. And it's sort of, that's just the tip of the iceberg because you get a whole lot of benefits cascading from those changes. Um, yeah, so, you know, the biota, the soil fungi is really, really important too. And forgive me if you know this stuff, but um, it does so much. And that, that picture on the... Actually, I'll go to the next picture. This one here just shows the, the extent of the, of the fungal network, you know. Um, it, it, it basically extends the, uh, the ability of the plant to take up water and nutrients. And there's a fairly vigorous trading going on. Um, you know, the plant, the plants are providing sugars, and the and the uh, fungi is providing water and um, and water and nutrients. So yeah, one of the one of the um, so one of the research pieces we did was looking at an organic farm, and they had, um, and they, you know, you'll know these figures better than me, but 23 milligrams per litre olsen P, and that was just on the borderline. 
but the herbage tests were showing that there was a significant amount of phosphate available in the plant. So we can only assume that the, the microbiome is actually doing the, is doing, the, doing the mining of the phosphate, making it available. Um, one of the farms I, I've been looking at, uh, a guy called David Coles, uh, this is his, this is his, um, this is his permanent, permanent mix of, of seeds. And just amazing the results he's got. And I was looking the other day, just, if you just look at one, one of these plants, that's, that's um, plantain. It contains all that good stuff. And if you look at its effects, um, herpes, um, antibacterial properties, Staph Staphylococcus um, and others. So you know, I, I don't. I know the. I don't think the research has been done. But you've got to ask yourself: Is Mycoplasma bovis just a result of, you know, uh, a really unhealthy environment for those animals? And if you if you if you let you know, animals are much more sensible than we are, right? Eh? Because they know what they want to eat. And they know what's good for them. And if they get an opportunity, they'll eat. You don't know what they're going to eat. Um, you know, they, one day they might go for, for flax, and the other day they'll just ignore it. But they know. Look, there's something else there. I'll, I'll just move on quite quickly, because I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, yeah, another thing that's really interesting, it's really relevant here. This is a farm I went to a couple of weeks ago. I've been here a couple of times now. Gary Heyman. It's not a big farm. Uh, he's, a, he's an ex-pilot. Um, ex but um, the Kawakawa River runs right through his property. And you can imagine over the last year he's been flooded out a few times or flooded in, you know, depending on where they are at the time. And, um, but what he's saying is he's observed that since he's initiated these regenerative practices, the recovery time for that pasture is much, much faster. And I ask myself, so what happens further up the catchment? If, if others further in their catchment were able to, 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 to get that same performance out of their soils, it could be that it's going to slow, you know, because there's a, there's a figure there somewhere, somewhere in this presentation, there's a figure that says... Um, I think 170, no, 17,000 litres per hectare or something like that um, for, for a 1% increase in, in, in organic matter in the soil. So if it, if, it can, if it can infiltrate better and if it can be stored better, we improve, we improve flood resilience and, and we improve... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, hang on. I'll turn this off. Yeah. That was 18 minutes. Yeah, there we go. I'll put it in my pocket. Yeah, we, impl we improve flood resilience and we improve, you know, um, but also drought. Uh, this, I just want to move on to something else quickly. Two minutes, yeah. That's disconcerting, that dinging in my pocket. Never mind. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what I, what I want to do in Northland, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but what I'm really keen to look at is like what, what, the, what the value proposition of 100% transition to regenerative agriculture would, would, would be. Looking at farm level, industry level, support service level, and regional level. But across those three dimensions, you know, environmental, socio-cultural, and economic. And you, you, you just start to get something like this. So for example, um, reduce fertilizer inputs, Reduce runoff into streams, um, and a reduction in those support services, which is probably a bit of a negative, um, because you know you, you, you're looking at, at uh, a, a bit of a sinking lid on your inputs, and the, and the improved animal health has massive massive um, gains, especially economically. Uh, you know, so I'd like to go through that whole thing, and and look at it based not on sort of blind studies and those sorts of things, but based on, you know, what farmers' experiences are of, of those sorts of changes. Because I think, like, you know, Mike talked about the value proposition for the country in a way. And if we don't change, we're just going to be... We're, we're just another commodity in a world awash with commodities, eh? Especially if the Chinese market continues to go the way it's been going. 
Um, yeah, there's a bit of a summary, but I'll finish it there.